So, the eight precepts. We uh, usually Buddhists take five precepts. Precepts are usually done on special days, uh, or if people are actually staying in the, the temple overnight, uh, they tend to take the eight precepts. Uh, but as I say, usually during the week we take five precepts, and so basically I'll go through the five precepts first because there's actually a slight change in one of the precepts that takes place when we go on to the eight. So I'll explain the five first and then um, as I'm explaining that I will explain the change in one of the precepts that we take. So the first precept, I won't do the party. Um, is I undertake to observe the precept to abstain from destroying living beings. Uh, some translations would say um, I undertake the training rule to abstain from killing living beings. So in this book here it's the precept but in other uh, ones it's, it's a training rule. Um, and again, I'm not going to get pedantic over if you want to call it a precept or a training rule. So, you know, we all value our lives. You know? uh, we take food to sustain our body. Uh, when we're in the car, we put the seatbelt on just in case we get in a wreck, we don't want to go flying through the windscreen or out through the window. You know, we get sick, we go to the doctor, and then we go to a Chinese doctor, or if we go for Western medicine, it's neither here nor there, we get sick, we try to get well. Um, you know, we, a lot of people are really, really fussy about what food they eat, because some people won't eat, or well, some people only eat organic foods, for instance. They don't want to have anything that's had pesticides put on it because it can possibly not be good for our body. It could be playing havoc with some of our internal organs, some of these pesticides. So people want to eat organic food. Of course, you have to be quite a rich person to be able to eat organic food all the time, but you know, we do. We try to, you know, have a, have a good varied diet. You can't live on fast food all the time, no matter how much it might taste nice and how quick it is to, to get, you know, just pop into Burger King and get a couple of burgers and some fries, you know. But it's not the best food for you. It might be okay from time to time, but, you know, to go to Burger King for their breakfast and then pop in at lunchtime and at dinner time is probably not particularly good for, for a person's health. So we can see how much we care about our own bodies. Now, in Buddhism, of course, we start to think about other living beings. You know, we understand that although we do have to die, you know, most of us still worry about you know, dying. And so we have to stop and think, well, other beings also want the same happiness as I do. And so we try not to kill them. Now, this actual precept is often I undertake the rule of training to abstain from harming living beings. So we actually kick it up a step. You know? Like I said earlier on, you know, we don't kick the dog you know, because that would harm the dog dog wouldn't be particularly happy being kicked. So we don't just refrain from killing living beings, but we try not to harm living beings. 
Now, we've got to be careful here. A guy was asking me one day, he said, oh, he said, but, you know, when I drive my car, he said, you know, I splat bugs on the windscreen. When I cut the grass, I kill all sorts of bugs. He said, there's no chance of escaping the cycle of samsara. But he was mistaken because to kill something, there has to be an intention to kill something. And I don't know of anybody who jumps in their car with the intention of squashing bugs on the windscreen. <laughs> the intention is usually to get from point A to point B. So when you're cutting the lawn, you don't get the lawnmower out going, oh, I'm going to go out and kill millions of bugs in my grass. No, you go out with the intention of actually cutting the lawn. So you know, there's a number of factors that take place um, because all of these things, karma is based upon intention. It's thought. Um, so there has to be a thought. So to kill something, first and foremost, there has to be an intention to kill something. So you have, you know, so you have an intention, you, act, you know it's a living being. You know? So you have to actually know that there's a living being and, and the intent to kill it is there. You know, you know it's sentient. And so you have to have this intention. So you've chosen your victim, you've got this intention. You do whatever, and you shoot it and knife it and pass it across the head with a lump of four by two, whatever it is and then that being dies. And so all the factors involved in a killing have actually taken place. Mm -hmm. If it's an accidental killing, like if you run somebody over, unless you deliberately aimed your car at them, it's not actually a killing. Mm -hmm. Also, if you think about killing somebody but you don't kill them, it's not a killing. However, there is karma in the thought to kill. There is negative karma in the thought to kill. But as I say, we take it up a, a level of saying that, you know, we don't harm living beings. So to the best of our ability, you know, as I say, you don't kick the dog, you don't throw the cat across the room because it left a little message for you on the carpet. You know, it's not what you do. Um, you know, we get into, <laughs> people say, well, what about mosquitoes? Yeah, and cockroaches, they're sentient, you know. I was stung by a scorpion in Thailand a few years ago. I woke up about one o'clock in the morning, I felt this pain in my chest, and I was like, oh. Um, and I turned the light on, there's a scorpion on the floor. And I was like, oh yeah, no, that, I know where that owl came from, um, you know, just being stung by a scorpion. Oh. The thing was, obviously, I'd been laying on the floor sleeping. The scorpion had obviously snuggled up next to me. Mm. And I rolled in my sleep. The mm. natural thing for the scorpion was to protect itself. Because it's not human, so it doesn't understand the Buddhist concept of non harming. <laughs> and it stung me. So the first thing I had to do was pick the scorpion up and take it outside. Mm. And, which I did. Gave it a little lecture on, you know, the karma of stinging a monk. <laughs> and I put it outside and I let it go. You know, a natural instinct would be to squish it, you know, because, you know, I was, I was already feeling some pain, you know, like I, I could feel the poison spreading, you know. But I didn't, I took the scorpion outside and I released it. And not long after I became a Buddhist, I had a girlfriend and she used to go spare at me because you know, there'd be a mosquito in the house. You know, and she'd be looking for the bug spray and I'd be getting a glass. And you know, chasing the mosquito around with the glass, trying to get it into the glass so I could catch it and put it outside. You know, because as far as I was concerned, the mosquito had as much right to live <laughs> as any other thing. The same with cock cockroaches, rats. You know, they're all sentient beings. You know, and they all just want to be happy. So you can catch a cocky, you know. Cockroach runs across your floor. You can find a glass or something. I don't want to talk. Piece of carpet underneath, take it outside. Bye-bye. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Good.
good exercise if it's too fast. You know? <laughs> but they, you know, mosquitoes, cockroaches, they're all sentient beings. They, you know, they want to be happy. And so we try not to kill them. Now, of course, we have a problem here, like, we've got a dengue problem here in Malaysia, you know, or in parts of Malaysia. And so people say, well, you know, what if there's a dengue mosquito lands on my baby? And then I say, well, if I kill it, my intention is for my baby not to get dengue fever. Actually, no, it's not. Your intention is to kill the mosquito. The motive, you see, when you go to court, and I'm not saying to try this just as an experiment, but, you know, when you go to court, let's say you steal something, you've, you've been caught stealing food from the shop, and you have a lawyer, you know, and so you go to court and you plead guilty because you're up on a charge of shoplifting. You, know, you stole food from the shop. And so, you know, that's the charge. It's stealing food. And so you stole it, you're guilty. So you admit you're guilty. Now, your lawyer will then give your motive for stealing the food. So you don't deny the theft, but you give the circumstances under which you gave the theft, and then you hope that the magistrate has some leniency and he understands that you are hungry, you haven't eaten for a couple of days, and you know, you stole this, and, and so instead of giving you three months in the slammer, you know, he gives you a three month suspended sentence, you know, he doesn't want to see you in front of him for the next three months, and otherwise he's going to lock you up. So you admit the guilt, but there's a motive behind it. Now, so sometimes you may do something that breaks the precept. So when you do it, you have to understand that you're still breaking the precept even though your motive behind it may be honourable now the the reason behind the killing i.e. to save the baby from getting dengue fever there can be enough wholesome karma involved in that side of it to help balance out the other side of it you know, so the, the, the unwholesome karma of the killing and there's the wholesome karma of why you did the killing. So they can start to weigh up against one another. But we still have to understand that we killed something. So as I say, with the first one, when we look at it, we, we, we try not to harm other living beings to the best of our ability. As I say, you drive in your car, you do get bug splat on the windscreen. Uh, um, when you're walking down the footpath, you kill things. Ants cockroaches, all sorts of things, you know, that you don't see when you're walking down the street because we don't always look straight down, you know, we have to be looking straight ahead. But these are accidental, we're not deliberately harming them, so, you know, we don't have to worry about this. Right, so, the next one is I undertake to observe the precept to abstain from taking things not given. Well, that's quite simple, we don't steal stuff. <laughs> it's as easy as that. Now the bad news is next year you will have to pay GST. <laughs> <laughs> this is affectionately called crab steal and take in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to pay our taxes. You know, tax evasion is theft. Even if you think the government's stealing from you, <laughs> the law of the land states that you have to pay your taxes. You know, so when you do these, I mean, I used to be a house painter, and I used to do cash jobs. <laughs> so there was no tax paid on the on the money whatsoever. You know, the government just did, didn't know anything about it. But it's theft. You know, it's actually it's actually taking what was not given. Um, and so we have to be very careful with that one. You know, it's it's a fairly it's a fairly basic thing. It gets a bit difficult when you're a monk. You know, like, um, you know, when we're sitting there at, at the table 
getting our dharma, you know, we have an empty plate and people come around and they, you know, they offer the food and they'll thank you, thank you, thank you. But there's often a slant that they have these plates of fruit sitting in front of us. Well, technically speaking, unless somebody offers me that plate of fruit, I can't eat it. Because even though it's sitting in front of me, I, I'm not actually allowed to assume that it's mine. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it has, the, the only thing I can take without being, having it offered is water. Um, and so, yeah, taking what's not given. So, you know, we basically know we're not supposed to steal things. You know? um, and so that's a fairly simple one to kind of understand, you know. Um, I know often we borrow things. I mean, technically speaking, a monk shouldn't even borrow something without being, without actually asking, can he borrow it? He shouldn't assume that his fellow monk would lend it to him, you know. Um, basically, he's broken the precept. <laughs> but I mean, often, oftentimes, I mean, you have a neighbor and you know, it's just an unwritten thing if you need to borrow the neighbor's, you know, she has to, you know, touch a hedge or whatever it is, the neighbor's always happy for you to borrow as long as you give it back. Mm -hmm. you know, the neighbor shouldn't have to come and ask you if you can have it back. So, so the third one, now this is the one I wanted to point out uh, where it changes slightly. In the five precepts, it says I undertake to observe the precept to abstain from sexual misconduct. So first of all, sexual misconduct, what is sexual misconduct? And basically, you don't play up on your partner. You know, in Buddhism, you don't have to get married in Buddhism. It's uh, not necessary. There's nothing in the sutras that says you have to actually go and do any sort of a ceremony. You know, the law of the land may be different, you know, the piece of paper, you know, and all this sort of thing. But, you know, unlike, unlike Christianity, Christianity, sexual immorality would be having sex outside of marriage, and Buddhism is not. Uh, Buddhism is all about being faithful to your partner. Um, you know, that can, uh, that can get a little bit dodgy because, I mean, I guess there are some societies where you have more than one wife, for instance. Mm -hmm. you know. I'm not quite sure how Buddhism would handle that, but I guess if nobody's being harmed, if it's the cultural thing, you know, even that's probably okay. You know. Um, but generally speaking, you know, we have a tendency in most places to be uh, monogamous, so we have one partner. Now, of course, sometimes relationships go bad. And you wouldn't be expected to stay in a bad relationship. You know, if, if your if your wife beats you, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> you know, but if one of the partners is beating the other partner, then you you can't be expected to stay in, in, in this relationship. And so you move out of the relationship. You can start a new relationship. You know, you've not broken any precept. That relationship's over. You've come out of an abusive relationship. It's now finished. So now you can take a new partner if you so desire. If you're being beaten by a partner because you've already got a new partner, then that's your own fault. You know, from that. <laughs> uh, you started it. Okay. Now there's also um, the Vinaya gets very deep on this talks about if uh, like if a woman's in the care of her father for instance which I would say probably translates today to being under the legal age you know? um, so you're not allowed to go down that road you know? and anyway there are laws of the land that you know depending on what country you're in you know, that has an age of consent um, and so you're not allowed to go there. That's against the law, and therefore you'd be breaking the precept. She's under the care of her father. Um, now it says a woman wearing garlands. I'm assuming that's an engaged woman. You know, so technically speaking, she's considered to be somebody's partner if she's engaged. So you're not supposed to 
know, way down that road either. It's kind of not the dumb thing. And so it's all about being faithful to the partner that you're with. Now, in the eight precepts, it changes. It now becomes observing the precept to abstain from any sex, celibacy. Um, you're in a monastery, and so it's hardly the place to be playing that particular game. And then it does the game of when I gets very, very uh, down to the nitty gritty, <laughs> so to speak. I mean, it basically says, you know, you're not allowed to use the washing machine, but you're also not allowed to do the laundry by hand. <laughs> you get the drift. And so it's a total abstinence from sex when it comes to the eight precepts. Now the next precept, that's a real that's a doozy this one. I undertake to observe the precept to abstain from false speech. There's false speech, harsh speech, divisive speech, and gossip. <laughs> so false speech, basically that's lying, telling lies. See, normally when we tell lies, we tell lies to get somebody else into trouble and to make ourselves look good. Mm -hmm. you, know, you learn this when you're a kid. Who broke that? Not me. <laughs> she did it. <laughs> oh, the dog did it. <laughs> but it was never you. You know, we always lie to protect ourselves. Now, it does get dodgy sometimes. It's, you know, like I was saying with the killing, sometimes with lying, I think we have to lie. You know, if, um, if somebody ran into here now and, and, and hid underneath the desk and then somebody else came in holding a baseball bat and have you just seen, you know, <laughs> no, <laughs> I haven't. Now I'm still lying, there's no two ways about it, but seeing somebody scared underneath the table and somebody standing at the doorway with a baseball bat in their hand looking angry then I may assume that the person is going to try and hurt them. And so I would lie. My, the intention is to lie. The motive is to protect this person's karma and this person's karma. So starting to negate things. A classic example was during the Second World War in Europe where <laughs> you know, the Nazis were persecuting you know, the, the Jews, the gays, the gypsies and all that sort of thing. And you know, if, if you were living in, in an occupied country and a Gestapo officer came and said, you know, do you know where a Jewish family's hiding? If you did, I would suggest you would lie, mm -hmm. you know, um, because the lie is going to be by far outweighed by the motive behind the lie, which would be, which is actually you're protecting the Jewish people and you're also protecting the Gestapo officer because he's going to commit some very bad karma. Uh, so if you don't tell them where they're, where they're hiding, he can't take them away from guilt, therefore he's not committing non virtuous karma. So you're protecting the karma of many people. And so lying, sometimes it, it takes place. But basically, most of the time, we lie to protect ourselves, not to protect those that we love. You know, so we're not to lie. So that's the lying. Then there's harsh speech. Um, and we see this like, you know, get out of it, you idiot. Yeah. Not particularly nice. Calling people an idiot. We do it to our kids all the time. Why are you so stupid? Not a good thing to say to a child. <laughs> because the child can grow up believing that he's stupid. Yeah. And we see it at school, kids bully harsh words. Fat so, fat so, where's the money? It's not very nice. Person's overweight, so you know, you're fat. Well, they know they're fat. You don't need to tell them. <laughs> you know. So this is this is harsh speech. You know, we can be quite rude to people sometimes. Then there's divisive speech. Divisive speech is where we say things to try and push two people apart. You know, he, he said that about you. Did you ever say that about you? 
I, for some reason, sometimes we don't want people to be friends, so we try and put a wedge in between them, because I want to be that person's friend, you know, and so we say nasty things and try and cause a split. So we've got to be very careful of that. And then the last part of that one, of course, is gossip. <laughs> don't we just love a good gossip? Uh -huh. yeah. Sitting there at work, Oh, you know, I'm not one to gossip, but, <laughs> and away we go gossiping. And sometimes we go, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not interested in that. And you know, the others are gossiping away, and we're kind of like leaning to one side and trying to actually listen because we still want to hear it. You know? And gossip's really harmful, especially these days with the internet and you know, things like Facebook. I saw a thing a while ago with a, a, a young fellow in the States. He committed suicide and it turned out that on Facebook, he, whether it was true or not, but people were saying he was gay, a young 14 year old. And he couldn't handle the bullying that he was getting from all this gossip and, and, and so he killed himself. And gossip sure really quite nasty. And, and you can't take the gossip back. Once you've got it out of your gob, it's gone. And it spreads like what? Well, you know, because people say, oh, keep this between you and me. <laughs> and as soon as you hang up, they're like, they're on the telephone, like, listen, don't say anything. This is just between the two of us. But I just heard, and it's all over the place. And then when the first person who spread the gossip in the first place realised it wasn't gossip, they bring you back, and, oh no, it's a mistake, but oh, it's too late, the cat's out of the bag. You know, the harm has been done. And, and gossip is, it's, it's really, really hurtful. When people lose their jobs through gossip, and say people take their own lives. Some people may be killed because of gossip. You know, if somebody said something that's not true, somebody gets upset, jealous, or whatever it is and they get killed because somebody's gossiped about something and even if it is true it doesn't matter you know you don't, you don't gossip about it we have to be very careful about about our speech our speech is quite harmful you know, just once it's out you can't take it back it doesn't work it's gone you know, so we have to be very careful now these four precepts they are designed to prevent harm to other people or to other beings. They are designed, they're specifically designed to look after other people and to keep them safe. Well, the fifth one, to abstain from intoxicants that lead to heedlessness. Now, this one I get a lot of people try to make their way around this one ever so slightly. First of all, some people say, well, it only mentions intoxicants, it doesn't mention drugs. Well, I'm quite sure that drugs would come under the heading of intoxicants, <laughs> you know. Um, so getting stoned is as bad as getting drunk. Uh, First of all, some, some people say, but it's okay to have a glass of wine, a glass of beer with your dinner. But in actual fact, the precinct doesn't say that. You see, they say, if you have a glass of wine or a glass of beer with your dinner, you're not going to get drunk. But the precinct says to abstain from intoxicants that lead to heedlessness. It doesn't say to abstain from toxicants to the point where you get drunk. It says that lead to heedlessness. And therefore, taking one drink is actually breaking the precept. Oh, these sad faces. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, there's people say, well, I cook with wine. Well, that's probably okay. Because if you're cooking with it, you're probably cooking the alcohol out. 
the heat will take the alcohol out of, of it. But, but you have to be careful. I remember there was a uh, there was a case in New Zealand a while ago. Where somebody uh, about Christmas time. It was Christmas Day, day after Christmas, whatever. And of course, our police they're, they're out in force over the Christmas period. You know, New, New Zealanders like to drink and drive. Um, uh, actually, I don't think we're very good at driving sober. <laughs> We learn to drive drunk, and the concept of driving without any alcohol in us is just scary. But this, this person went out about Christmas time, got to a, a random breath testing station, pulled over by the police. And the cop said, Have you been drinking, sir? I was like, No, no, not at all. We got these really cool little breathalysers. You don't they don't stick a tube in your mouth, you just talk to it. You, know, you put it up near your mouth and you and you chat to it and you know, count to ten. You know, one, two, three. And this thing will register the alcohol on your breath. <laughs> They're very sensitive. So those chaps, you know, chatted to the breathalyzer. And he's way over the limit. He's drunk. And I said, are you sure you had nothing to drink? He's like, nothing. <laughs> it was all about yesterday. He's like, no, nothing. You know, and he said, I said, why haven't had a drink for two days? So you'd have to have drunk a lot. And if you haven't had a drink for two days, you'd have to have drunk a lot to blow over the limit, you know. So that's how I said, well, where the heck have you got this alcohol from? And he said, what if you've been eating? And the guy turned around and he said, oh, this, 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 Christmas cake. And the guy said, Christmas cake? And he said, would that be the one, he said, with all the fruit that's been soaked in whiskey and rum? And he said, oh, no. Well, the judge let him off. The cop had to give him a ticket because he was over the limit. To give him a ticket, take his car keys. So the guy went to court rather than, you know, so he went to court, explained the whole situation to the judge. The judge believed him, let him go, you know, and just warned him about eating his mother in law's Christmas cake in future. So we have to be very careful with, you know, with the way we do use alcohol in our coffee. But the problem with alcohol is. I mean, one, for some people, a glass of wine is too much. Some people can't drink. Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about alcoholics, I'm just talking about people who've got no tolerance for alcohol whatsoever. Um, and they can't drink. So one glass is enough to send them a bit doolally, a bit silly. And when you drink, and you start drinking to an excess. Because I, I mean, I know myself, you know, people would say to me, oh, we, how about we go to the pub, we're just going to have one beer. <laughs> no, we won't. <laughs> you know, nobody goes to the pub for a beer. <laughs> you, know, you have two beers and then three beers sounds quite good. And then at the end of the night, you stay at home or jump into your car and drive home <laughs> if you're a Kiwi. <laughs> I'm going to get crucified when I go back to New Zealand. <laughs> but so we can say alcohol, you know, we do, we have a tendency, it's a social drink, we use it quite a lot. But when we drink, it's very easy to break the other four precepts. I mean, the lies you hear talked in the pub. I used to live in a little country town some years back. And there's a lot of sheep in that town. And of course you get these truck drivers who have to come and collect the sheep to take them off to the abattoir. And you should have heard these blokes when they were drinking. They hauled thousands of sheep that day. <laughs> they must have had super-sized trucks. The more they drank, the more sheep they hauled. The lies were just phenomenal. Killing people. I got, I got a mate, and he got done for murder. He got 20 years, and he can't remember doing the killing. That's how drunk he was. 
And if he'd have been sober, he would never have killed the person. But he got very drunk, got very angry, got out of hand, and he beat somebody to death. Something he could not do. And our prisons are full of people who, because of drink or drugs, have done something silly that they would never, ever have done if they hadn't have been under the influence. So we can see alcohol can really, really cause a lot of pain. Marriages break up because of it. A lot of domestic violence because of it. You know, it, it can really have an adverse effect upon people. And so we taking this precept, really, the precept does say not to take any alcohol or any form of intoxicant, you know. And that's why I say even drugs, you know, people smoking marijuana or whatever it is, it's the drug of choice today. You know, they will lead to heedlessness. You know, and that's what it says. It says that lead to heedlessness. So it doesn't say don't get drunk, don't get stoned. It says don't take these things that lead to heedlessness. So we have to be very, very careful with that one. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, so the next one is to observe the precept to abstain from eating at improper times. This was actually <laughs> this was actually introduced because believe it or not, there used to be some naughty monks. Well, I know hard to believe now. <laughs> and these monks were naughty during the Buddha's time. So I and once they see, originally when the monks were ordained, they were on five precepts. Actually, the original monks weren't on any precepts. I think it was just a taken that they would live a certain way. But then when the Buddha first started using precepts, he used five. Mm -hmm. Round up at 227, so, you know, you've got to think that there was a few weird things taking place. Right? And it started with five. And so eating wasn't a problem. The monks could go and do arms around and they could eat when they felt like eating. Now, one of the problems uh, was that you know, some of the monks, being a bit naughty, they'd kind of you know, be, be walking down the road at you know, 6.30, 7 o'clock at night, go past somebody's house and mm, he got in. <laughs> <laughs> Smells nice. <laughs> And they go and knock on the door. G'day! <laughs> just passing, how's it going? Oh, would you like some tea? One day, oh, well, you know, no, it just goes. And they would just become a complete and utter nuisance to the lay people. Because the lay people felt that they had to give to the monks. And so the Buddha turned out and said, okay. He said, we have a correct time for eating. Now, the Buddha, <laughs> The one I think is really dicky on this one, it's like, if I can hold my hand out in front of me and I can see the lines on my hand, then it's light enough for me to go on arms round. If I can't see the lines on my hand, then it's too dark and I'm not allowed to go on my arms round. Or if I can see the different shades of green on the leaves of a tree. I knew one monk used to get his torch out and go, yeah. <laughs> 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 Slightly cheating. <laughs> so, but the Buddha did he, so he said, look, he said, you know, it's got to be from sunrise, basically until the zenith. Some people say midday, but others say the zenith. And I would say the Buddha was probably talking about the zenith. I don't think he had a watch. So basically when the sun was directly over here, which here in Malaysia is roughly one o'clock in the afternoon would be the zenith. And so a monk is not supposed to take any food after this time. And so originally this rule was brought in to basically protect the lay people. I mean, could you imagine me you know, running around wondering, I mean, Brother Eric knows I like Chinese food. Imagine me six o'clock at night starting to wander around the streets of Kuala Lumpur where all the Buddhas live. Mm, it smells good. <laughs> I just happened to have my arms bowl with me. <laughs> yeah, fill her up. <laughs> so, first of all, it was it was done to protect the lady. 
But the other thing it does is we tend to overeat. And we also eat the wrong way round. I mean, we, we have a tendency, you know, you get up in the morning, you, you, you can't be bothered cooking breakfast anyway, you know. And most of the girlfriends I knew wouldn't cook breakfast for me. <laughs> get it yourself. <laughs> So it was like, you know, a cup of coffee and a cigarette, that was breakfast, you know, off out the door. And then you have your lunch at midday, it tends to be a bit bigger. Now we should have had a big breakfast because we're working. So it's a cup of coffee and a cigarette, and out the door, ready for work. Hardly the way to set yourself up for the day. Lunch, okay, fair enough. But then we get home and we cook this massive feed and then sit down and watch television and go to bed. <laughs> and so we've got all these calories just kind of sitting there quivering. You know, it's not good for our health. So we eat the wrong way anyway. We should have that big, big meal at breakfast time. But who's going to get up two hours before work to cook a big feed? Nobody, huh? You know? And so... But when we eat a lot, we get tired. Eating is very conducive to, you know, we, we want to have a rest after we've eaten. Now, when we're meditators, we want to spend as much time as we can meditating. Ah, not sleeping. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know there's laying down meditation, but there isn't sleeping meditation. It's not mentioned in the suttas. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't exist. <laughs> And so eating too much is conducive to sleep. So, and the other thing, of course, is if we're not eating after midday or after the zenith, then we're not planning a menu if you cook for yourself. Or we're not planning what restaurant we're going to eat at if you'd like to eat out. And so it's something that our mind is not thinking about when we're trying to practice meditation. If you don't eat at night, then you're not thinking about food after midday. And of course, I know sometimes it can be difficult when <laughs> I used to see people used to come when I was in Thailand, I used to run this retreat for foreigners, and they used to come and we'd whack them on eight precepts. And one of the biggest fears that people had was, how am I going to survive not eating after midday? <laughs> <laughs> because they're not used to it. And I said, you get used to it. But it's, the first few days is difficult. You know, your stomach is used to having food put in it. It just makes all these weird noises. <laughs> Feed me now. <laughs> And, and they do, they have a, but they find after a few days that actually, that, that actually the whole thing goes away, you know, and, and so they're no longer, it's not interfering in their meditation, their stomach has shrunk down to a different size, and then get on with their practice. And so we can see that, you know, there's there's two things are happening here, you know, that you're not, like I say, for the, for the lay people, they've not got these mad monks doing nothing all hours, they're trying to get some nosh to eat. <laughs> and you know, and it, and it helps with your meditation practice. So it's, it, it makes sense not to be overeating. I, I actually have a problem here because they eat twice a day, and um, I'm not used to eating twice a day. I'm used to eating once a day. Oh no, they're allowed to, there's, there's, there's no, see the Buddha, he originally he said, he restricted it to two meals. Afterwards he said, if you can eat one meal a day, it's better. But he didn't make it a rule, it's not a hard fast rule. And, and actually it's funny because in the, in, in the forest tradition, it can be interpreted in two different ways. See, so, I used to take my, my food, I had my arms bowl, I'd eat my meal, and that was it. It was it was over. Now for some of the monks, what they used to do was they'd get their arms bowl, they'd fill it up fairly high, and they'd say, 
this is my one meal, and they'd eat some of it at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they'd eat some of it at 11.30 in the morning. One meal split into two. You know, you know. And others would just have a meal at this time and a meal at this time. It's okay to have the two meals. There's no, there's the actual, the Wunaya doesn't forbid that. The Buddha just said it was better if you could eat once per day. So it's okay for them to eat twice a day. There's, there's no problem there. But with me being so used to once a day, I still have quite a, I mean, they, they do cook breakfast here, you know. <laughs> they, they really do. Well. Like, you know, roti chai and, 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 and dal and all sorts of things. It's really good, aren't you? <laughs> some fruit here and, <laughs> and I always have plenty to eat but of course I come at lunchtime because the devotees are here and the devotees they want the opportunity to give to the, to the monastics so I come down anyway you know but I'm sort of, I don't know, like, you know one scoop of rice or something you know, that's enough for me <laughs> I, I try to have a small amount you know because my stomach is just not into eating twice a day. Eric was just sharing um, lots of the food process. We don't really <laughs> say no to... <laughs> because most of the devotees were, were eager to... Oh, they are. Yeah, and that's, it's that, not like you don't want yeah, food. But this is why what I do, you see, they come around. I mean, the worst is children. Yeah. Uh, really, the worst is I, I cannot say no to a child. You know, A child comes, a child is so excited to be given to the monks that you can't say no. You know, there's no way you can say no to a little one. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> but what I do with, with adult devotees is, you know, just a little bit, a little bit. A little bit. We can do, yeah. You know, it's it's not nice, but you can do. And, and sometimes, but there's there's also things like. Here, for instance, there's vegetarian food and there's non-vegetarian food. Right? And but a lot of devotion because often they'll ask you, do you want chicken? Do you want pork? Now, you can say no. And a lot of the devotees know oh, this monk's vegetarian, this monk's not vegetarian. So, they, you know, so a lot of them won't even ask. You know, they'll go past you. Um, kind of different when I'm on art. See, when I used to do arms round, because of course we can't do arms round here in Kuala Lumpur, because it might be a bit difficult finding where the Buddhists are hanging out, you know, and it could, could be quite a long trek, <laughs> wandering for kilometre after kilometre trying to get a bit of grub. But in Thailand, for instance, you know, I would do Pindapat every morning, and whatever was offered, I took. The people had come, they'd cooked or bought from the market, they were waiting for me, and I would not refuse any food. Though a monk can refuse this, you know, like if they give me elephant, I can refuse it. Tiger, human, dog, snake, horse. These are not allowed to refuse. Also, if <laughs> There, there was a monk once, and a Western monk, and they went out. They went out. out They'd been invited out for dharma, and at their monastery, they had vegetarian food all the time. It was vegetarian, vegetarian, vegetarian. You know. And they got invited out to a place, and there was turkey. <laughs> 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 Turkey, <laughs> he's so excited, and the guy went, yeah, he said, he said, I know you Westerners right, he said, so I had this turkey killed for you, <laughs> can't eat it, you know, knowing that the meat was killed specifically for you, a monk cannot accept it, <laughs> back to veggies, <laughs> you know, so there are instances where we can refuse uh, food, but technically speaking, we don't refuse food. But here, the devotees do understand. And uh, like with me, for instance, being a Westerner, 
they will often stop and ask, will this be too hot for you? Um, generally speaking, no, but, um, but they will ask that question. So they don't want me to eat something that they think might have an adverse effect upon my health or I'm really not going to be able to eat it. You know? um, but being used to Thai red curries, I usually don't have too much of a problem with some of the spices that we have here in Malaysia. Um, so yeah, we try not to refuse food. But as I said, at the same time, some of the devotees actually do know. But I, I, you know, with kids, I don't refuse anything from the kids because you could break their hearts, could you? Hey, bless them. They come in and there's so much some big grins on their little faces. You know, how do you say no to that? Yeah. 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 I love the kids. You know, it's like. I don't want them to be going up going, well that monk wasn't very nice, he didn't want my grub. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you've got to you've got to think about who you're dealing with, you know. But as I say, because we have it's usually you have a core group of devotees come to the temple, so they've got a tendency to know what monks do and don't eat and so sometimes they go past. Uh, but they will know they will know I like my doll, they know I like my my chapati and my roti chai. <laughs> said to the Buddha was the monks must be vegetarian and the Buddha said no I don't bring in this rule because you know the reason the Buddha didn't bring in this rule was because a lot of the laity could only give things like maybe some chicken because they were poor so he said no I don't bring in this rule because you'd be making life difficult for the lay people. So then we get into this, so are we responsible? No. The killing will take place anyway. There's always going to be somebody going to eat the meat. You know, it's not just monks who eat meat. So no matter what, all the time you have people eating meat, animals will be slaughtered. You know? And so, as I say, the Buddha says we can't eat meat if we know it was killed for us, if we suspect it was killed for us, or if we've heard that it was killed for us, then a monk cannot touch the meat. But if you go to the supermarket and you buy some chicken and you're going to cook it up and you're going to bring it to the temple and offer it, to, that chicken was not killed for me. It was just killed. So there was no, so I don't need to suspect it was killed for me, you know, or I've not heard that it was killed for me, and I've not seen that it was killed for me, because it wasn't. It was killed for the supermarket. But then, if you are being a monk, um, wouldn't you have this thought that says, you know, I shouldn't be eating this? No, not no. at all. No. <laughs> no, I, I don't have to. What, what some monks do is, you can get clever. <laughs> You can give Dharma talks on compassion. Now when you give Dharma talks on compassion, the first thing we have to do is we have to be careful that we're not making accusations like, Oh, you're a cow, you're a chicken. No, that's, that's not, that's wrong speech. Uh, you know, we, we have to be careful about how we speak. But we can talk about compassion. And so we can talk about how all animals want to live. And how if you could be vegetarian, it would be better, you know, or compassionate or whatever, you know. So we can give Dharma talks on how it might be better to be a vegetarian. And then 
in the lab and say, assuming that they're listening to your Dharma talk, uh, they might turn around and go, oh, I might, I might be a vegetarian. Why keep putting pork in his, <laughs> pork in his arm bowl? And then they can stop. They'll stop putting things in your bowl for you. So, so there are little tricks that we can pull, you know, that actually help. Of course, if I went to China, it wouldn't be a problem, you know, because the monks in China are vegetarian. But that was a rule brought in by an emperor as opposed to by the Buddha. So it wouldn't be a problem. In fact, if we're, when I'm going to Taiwan at the end of this month, and somebody said, yeah, <laughs> they said, if you tried to go into a restaurant and order something that had meat in it, they'd chuck you up because you're in robes, you know. So, I mean, that's, that's the way it is there. They, you know, they're vegetarian. The monks are considered to be vegetarian. So it's not a wrong. Here, it all depends, you know. Some devotees, sometimes it comes down to a person's nationality as to what you get on your plate. You know, there are times that everything in there is vegetarian. You know, there's not a piece of meat to be seen. And other times people turn up with boxes of Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's like, you know, you, just, you take what you get. But as I say, we can sort of like, uh, no thanks. We can say, no thanks, uh, I've got enough. So because we're not supposed to overeat and we shouldn't be wasting food so we can say even if it's a bit of a lie mm, mm, no thanks I've got enough and normally it's not a bit of a lie anyway because you know you get 20 devotees it doesn't take much before you've got too much on your plate <laughs> so you can say no I'm, I'm fine thank you, you know, and leave it at that so there are ways of going about things you know um, but yeah it is a, it is a grey area you know, and it's one of these things you know you you go online, you'll find it, you know, just about every second day somebody's got something about, oh, you should be a vegetarian, you know, so, oh, you should keep your opinion to yourself. You know, you know, I'm a good Buddhist because I don't eat meat. You're not a good Buddhist because you're using harsh speech. <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, I often say to people, I think there's a quote in the Bible that says, it's not what goes into your mouth that's harmful, but what comes out of your mouth. You know, and, um, and 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 Adolf Hitler, by the way, was vegetarian. So, <laughs> so vegetarianism doesn't necessarily equal compassion. Uh, you know, he didn't like eating animals, but he didn't mind murdering Jews and gays and gypsies and stuff like that. So, you know, he's not the most compassionate person, even though he didn't eat meat. So, but yeah, it's a tough one. But you know, if you want to give a monk vegetarian food, he, he's not supposed to argue with that either, you know, he should be quite content and, you know, a lot of Chinese food is vegetarian and it's, you know, it's very nice and you know, I'm not going to argue about that one. So that's the precept to abstain from eating at improper times. Oh, now here's the goodie, eh? Hey? I undertake the precept to abstain from dancing, singing, music. <laughs> Wearing garlands, using perfume, and beautifying with cosmetics. I remember a girl, she was coming on a course one day and she went, Oh, she said, But if I take the eight breaths, she said, Oh, I like dancing. She said, oh, Am I never allowed to dance again in my life? <laughs> I said, That's no, all right, we'll take you back to five precepts when you leave. <laughs> you know, but again, these things, they're distractions. Um, pure distractions and and a lot of see a lot of these precepts see these precepts are basically they're monks rules the first five are the first five are rules for basically everybody the rest of them they were put there for the sake of the monks not for the sake of the laity but they're still relevant you see okay you guys Thanks to your generosity, I have a roof over my head. Thanks to your generosity, I have robes, I have medicinal needs, and I have food. The things that I need to stay healthy. So, you just imagine if, <laughs> you know, walking through, uh, where is it? 
probably a mint value, I think. I'll pass there a few times. Imagine you're coming and you're down in the mint valley and you see a bunch of monks coming out of the cinema. <laughs> <laughs> these monks and living their holy life. And here they are watching the latest movie that's just come out on the big screen. Uh, and of course the monks were doing this. You know, of course we didn't have movies in the Buddhist time, you know, but we have these traveling troops and dancers and acrobats and all sort of thing. So the way people were, they were taking food and stuff, all the monks were going out on arms round. And the whole, the, basically the deal was, you know, you give me food, I practice, I teach you the Dhamma. Uh, yeah, works well, symbiotic. Uh, not, you give me food, I go to the movies. Uh, not why, <laughs> that's not why you're feeding me, that's not why you give me robes. And so, the what is said, you can't be doing that. You can't be going off to the, you know, to the show. You can't be going off to the circus and having a, having a good time. Singing and dancing. There's nothing wrong with singing. There's nothing wrong with dancing. Just because you sing and dance doesn't mean to say that you go to hell. <laughs> it's uh, just not, not going to happen. But the distractions. One, to go and watch singing and dancing is a distraction, you know, you, you hear, you know, the person's got a really nice voice, and the person, you know, you're seeing, you know, you're seeing dancers, and you're, oh, she's hot, you know, it's a distraction, or, oh, he's a bit of a hunk, you know, ooh, 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 ooh. it's a distraction, you know, and it's like, and it takes us outside, you know, we're using, we're going out through the sense doors, you know, which the Buddha refers to as Mara's domain. You know, when we go out through the sense doors, we, we're entering the domain of Mara. You know, so we have to guard the sense doors constantly. And of course, you can start to get attracted to you know certain things. I mean, I used to love going to rock concerts and festivals and stuff like that. I used to live. You know, I, used to, I was one of those people that had you know the wristbands. Would take one look at the wristband and they'd know what year, what festival, and you wore it like, you know, the pride. And, and that was it. I, I loved going to concerts, I loved going to festivals. Spent a lot of my time in these places. Which is okay, because I wasn't a monk and I wasn't practicing meditation. But if I was trying to practice meditation, it would take me out of it. It would take me out of my practice. I even have to be careful, you know, because I have a Facebook page and I don't know, about 500 odd friends mm -hmm. on Facebook. And, you know, like, uh, some of them post music videos. And I didn't even look at half of these videos because it's like, you know, just recently they, they put up, somebody whacked up a Led Zeppelin video. Well, Music has a tendency to take you back in time and back in places. And Led Zeppelin was one of my favorite groups, you know, and it's like, and that was kind of, you know, in my teenage years when I was really starting to get into some stuff. So if I click on to that and start watching the video, then not only do I see the video, but then my memory starts to go back into the past and you start to reflect on the past. And so it can have that effect upon you. As I say, music's not evil. <laughs> you know, some people say it is, but it's not. But it, it becomes a distraction. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful with that one. Uh, wearing garlands, uh, using perfume, and beautifying with cosmetics. We were talking about this this morning that we can spend so much time. Well. Not you blokes, obviously, but you know, <laughs> accessorizing. Uh, you know, we, we run around and so like I say, you know, we, well, what am I going to wear with this? What am I going to wear with that? You know, <laughs> and, so, and it, it 
takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort. And it's also, there's a lot of ego attached, you know, we're trying to look better than the other person, you know, trying to look very smart, you know, obviously a fake came back, you know. <laughs> Mine's a better fake than her fake. <laughs> Running around with those Rolex watches, and we've got two L's in Rolex. <laughs> and we bought it cheap on some street in Central America. And so, you know, we, we spend a lot of time kowtowing to the ego. And again, it also, the time that we spend in preparation, as I say, you know, when we got up this morning, we had to do is find some whites. You know, you know. Not a lot of accessorizing necessary. You, know, you just go wear my whites and go into a temple. You know, but on other occasions, you just wouldn't wear whites. You know, you would start to you know worry. But you know, I mean, you ladies even have matching socks, <laughs> as opposed to us blokes who have two pairs of odd matching socks. <laughs> you know, yes, I've got a blue sock and a brown sock. I'm not got another pair like that at home. You know, that's us blokes don't. We don't care. But you do, you spend so much time accessorizing that it just takes us out of our practice. Now, cosmetics, well actually, I mean, you know, these days, are, I mean, you know, monks are supposed to use non-perfumed soaps, and, um, but in a hot climate that might not be conducive to having many friends, you know, as I'm about, you know. Um, but again, you see, we have to remember that a lot of these rules go back 2,600 years you know, to the time of the Buddha. Now, who wore cosmetics? Royalty. The kings, the queens. They, they wore cosmetics. Now, remember, as I said, these rules were basically laid down for monks. So if rich people you know, the, 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 the poor people smell like cow poo ah, you know, and stuff like that. They didn't smell like roses. Mm -hmm. you know. So if suddenly the monks are wearing perfume, then they're living like royalty. And then again, the lady would come, well, I can't afford perfume. You know. I've got cow poo on my foot, I stink. And the monk smells like a rose. So. So as I say, this this is quite an old precept, and, and, and you know, it's going to take you know for that particular precept, as I say, not to use a cosmetic. You might you might find yourself becoming offensive to those around you. It might be better to use a little bit of underarm deodorant or something like that. It's not, I don't think it's going to cause. It's hardly going to stop you from obtaining liberation. Uh, you know, not you know if you. A little bit of underarm deodorant is not going to prevent you from, you know, attaining enlightenment. <laughs> and the other one, I undertake to observe the precept to abstain from using high and luxury six. See, again, that goes back to royalty. You see, the lay people back in the Buddha's time would have either had very low cots or slept on the floor. Royal people, French people, rich people, they had high and luxurious beds. They had high and luxurious seats. And so, you know, again, if a monk had a big bed, then he obviously had more money than he was supposed to have, you know, because now we're getting into the tenth precept. <laughs> you know, and so, you know, a monk's not supposed to have a big, high, luxurious bed. But, you know, we do, today we can relate that back to, as I said this morning, a high and luxurious bed tends to have a lot of sleep in the mattress, you know, whereas a hard floor doesn't. You now, if you sleep on the floor, because the Buddha advises for, you know, about four hours sleep per night, you know, so, that's, you know, so that's enough if you, if you have to sleep, if it's absolutely necessary for you to sleep, then four hours is plenty. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't say that for you fellows that have got to, got to go out to work. It doesn't quite work like that, because again, he's talking to monks. You know. Us monks tend not to be too physical. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We 
don't, you don't see us out jogging, <laughs> or doing construction work, you know, so we basically eat and meditate, so, so we don't need to sleep a lot, you know, we should be practicing. Say. So the Buddha says, if you have to sleep, four hours should be plenty. You know? Otherwise, just meditate 20, you know, 24 hours a day. And so, so we take this rule back down to meditation, and we say, well, look, if we got this bed, you know, it's too easy to stay in it. You know? Whereas the floor, you lay on the floor, you don't get a good night's sleep when you lay on the floor, you know, because you wake up. I've got bony hips, I you know. My hips dig into the floor and I was like, got to flip over. It wakes me up, turn over back to sleep. So I have this very, very light sleep. And then when the alarm goes off, it's like, you know, thank goodness for that. You know. Time to get up. Most of the alarm goes off and we chuck the clock over the room and shut up. You know. and, um, you're laying on the floor sleeping, the alarm goes off. <laughs> <laughs> Time to get up, buddy. <laughs> and then my bones won't hurt so much. And so it does it. it again, it just helps us to not spend so much time asleep when we should be actually practicing. So that pretty much is the eight precepts in a nutshell. It's why we have them and what they what they're actually used for. Any questions on that?